And she said, you know, you talk about not really wanting to be around all these people in your office building. She goes, but you love writing. So maybe you just have a more of an introverted kind of style. And it was like, yeah, I, I kind of like being, I get energy when I'm by myself and I get drained when I'm around all these other people. And she said, well, maybe it's just time to go. Maybe it's just time to find something else to do. And he said, and I looked at her and I knew she was right. And he goes, and I was really scared to death. Because he said, I didn't think I could make a living any other way than how I knew, how I was doing it already at the newspaper. And he said he took a big risk and he quit his job. And he said, I was going to make a plan to do something else. And he goes, so he said, I figured I still had this radio show which paid him a fairly handsome sum of money. And he said that... I thought about, I had a couple of book deals that I hadn't really done much with. So he went and he took those two book deals and spent all of his time pouring all of his energy in his house every day over these two books, and he had a nice little break going into this one-hour radio show. So he published two books within the course of a year. I mean, that, and anybody who's a writer knows that's almost an impossible feat. And was able to have enough time to go out and market the books so that they sold more than any of the other books that he's ever done. Um, he felt great. <laughs> uh, and he had this one-hour radio show, which was basically his bread and butter kind of money that fed you know, all his basic needs and everything else. And I was like, wow, Arthur, that's a fascinating story. And he goes, yeah. And he said, so if you could just do anything tomorrow, what would that be? And I looked at him, and I looked at him, and I looked at him, and I said, I have no idea. And he, goes, and he goes, yes, you do. And I said, no, I really don't. And he said, ah, my God. And he goes, I'm going home. He goes, you go home, think about this, talk to me tomorrow. And he just left. And I was like, this is the weirdest man I've ever met. <laughs> and I was like, whatever. But, and I kind of planned to forget about his question and figure that he'll just forget about it tomorrow. We'd never talk about it again. And I went home, and I tossed, and I turned, and I couldn't sleep one wink that night. He did not mention it the next day, and I tossed, and I turned, and I really didn't sleep well the second night. The third night, I was full of dreams about all kinds of things, about why what I was doing really wasn't what I really felt empowered about. And finally, on the fourth day, I went to him when he walked in the door, and I went up to him, and I sort of grabbed him by the shirt, and I said, I hate you. <laughs> And he goes, what? He goes, you know, you've really been weird the last couple of days. I said, I'm sleep deprived. <laughs> I said, I'm on five cups, of, uh, five cups of coffee and three cans of Coke. And I said, and, it's, and I'm doing this just to produce your, as you say, silly little radio show. And he said, oh, okay. <laughs> I, said, I said, I have not been able to let go of that question. And, he, and still, of course, in a silly way, he goes, oh, what question is that? And I said, you know, if you could do anything, what could what would you do? And he goes, oh, okay. He goes, well, what's going on? I said, Arthur, I can't answer that question. He goes, all right, all right, I'll bail you out. And he said, are there things in your life that you feel a lot of energy from that you're already doing? And he said that, you know, when you're doing those things, you really feel like you've come alive. And I said, yeah. I said, there, there are. And he goes, what's the first one that comes to your mind? I said, well, that retreat I was on about a week and a half ago now. And he goes, uh-huh, see it. And he turned around and walked away. I was like, no, get back here. Where are you going? And he goes, and he goes go home, think about that. And he goes, we'll talk over the week, after the weekend was over. Well, let's just say it was another sleepless weekend. I came in Monday, a very angry young man. <laughs> and um, we sat down. He said, yeah, he said, if that retreat is something that, you know, you really feel empowered to do, he goes, don't you think you could just do that for a living instead of what you're doing? And I kind of laughed. And I said, I couldn't do that. I'd starve. And he said, hmm, do you really know that? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, he goes, I go to this retreat house in Litchfield, Connecticut every year. And he goes, he goes I know that there are nuns who kind of run the place. He goes, but there are a bunch of people I know who kind of look like you and walk like you and talk like you. And he goes, and they seem pretty happy doing what they're doing. And they all have families and nice little houses in Connecticut. And he said, I don't think you know that you can do this. And he said, in some ways, I think you need permission to go and do this. And I said, Arthur, can you please just cut to the chase and tell me what you think I should be doing at this point in time? 
And he said, yeah. He said, I want you to go out and I want you to interview five people who run retreat houses or who run retreats for a living. And he goes, and I don't care where you find them and I don't care what religious denomination they are. I just want you to go and talk to these people. And I said, okay. And I went and did it and it took me about two weeks. Um, one Jesuit in particular sat me down and was very formative in what he said. He said, um, so how long have you been running retreats? I said, well, I ran some in college. I said, I was trained to do it in college. I said, I was part of a, sort of a team in college. I said, but then when I left college, I went to this parish in Manhattan. And I said, and I've been running them there for the last six years. And he said, did you just tell me you were running retreats for the last six years for, like, young people? And I said, yeah. He said, do you know how valuable you are right now? And he said, you've got more experience than half the people I know with this. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah. I said, so I don't really need to go back to school to do this? And he goes, no. And I said, and someone will hire me to do this? He goes, yeah. And I said, well, let's go. <laughs> you know, what time do you want me? And I said, would you hire me? And he said, yeah, I don't have a job. <laughs> I was like, yeah, well, thanks, folks. You know, um, so I started at least looking for something along those lines at that point while I was still working in radio. Um, my associate pastor is a man named Father Brett Hoover, and uh, he came up to me one day and he said, "Mike, he goes, Mike, he goes, I'm a Paulist. He goes, we're having a meeting of our religious community, and he said, and I'd like you to come with me." And I said, well, I guess, well, you've been doing this retreat thing for a while, and I know you've told me you're kind of looking to move into that line of work. And he said, I at least think we have something that will let you do retreats a little bit more, even if it's just as a volunteer. He said, you know, he said, sometimes our vocation just isn't what we do for a living all the time. And he said, so if you want to do more retreats, I think I have a way to do it. We're talking about starting this national ministry to, for people in their 20s and 30s. Would you come to a focus group and tell them what we should be doing as retreats at least? And they said, and you know, you'll hear about the rest of what's going on with the program. And I said, yeah, that sounds good. And when is it? Friday night and all day Saturday. I was single, I was 28. Needless to say, this is not the best way I thought about spending my time. <laughs> and he played the Catholic guilt card. When have I ever asked you to do anything for me? <laughs> and I said, oh, Father Brett. And I said, okay, I'll come. Um, so I went and I got energized. Uh, your own Father John Cusick was actually at the meeting, uh, and he was very inspirational to me at that point in time, and said uh, and got us all sort of really excited about possibilities that were out there for young adults in the Catholic Church. Um, by the end of the meeting, we had decided two things. We decided that the national office for Paulist Young Adult Ministries uh, should do two things. One, they should do retreats for young adults of some sort. And we should do, needless to say, this is what they told us, something on the internet. This was in the year 2000 when, you know, people were just starting to get websites, really. <coughs> and that was the only direction that they chose to tell whoever was going to run this office uh, to go in. They said, so what do we need? Well, we need someone who has retreat experience to help us with that part. And we need something, someone who has media experience to help us with the other part. And boy, it would really be great if we had someone who had both of those things. And then all of a sudden, all the eyes in the room sort of turned over to me. And I said, oh, good God, it's me. <laughs> I was like, what do I do with this?